whatever problem we're talking about, whether it's climate change or terrible poverty and hunger in the world, whatever problem we're talking about, ultimately it boils down to whether we can come together to make decisions to solve them. So we can't just define the policies we need, we have to go a step back and ask what is the polity we need? What is the what is the true democracy that is accountable and transparent and, and inclusive that could actually come to the right policy choices and implement them? So that's really been the passion of my life, trying to, once I realized that hunger was not caused by scarcity of food, I realized that it was caused by scarcity of democracy. I've been trying to define, okay, where is, what is democracy that is powerful and vital enough to end hunger or any of the other terrible challenges facing us? And what I'm seeing is that we have to stop thinking of governance as just some elected body somewhere. That's only one piece of it. And the understanding of democracy that's emerging, I call living democracy. Living as a practice that we do every day, living as something that evolves, it's an organism itself that continues to evolve, and it is directly aligned with human needs and capacities. And those needs include our need for meaning, our pur need for purpose, and our need for efficacy, to have power, to have a voice in our world. And so living democracy is showing up now all over the world today. From villages I was just in, to, in India to worker-owned enterprises which are now spreading throughout the world. I calculated that there are more people who are members of cooperatives that are democratically governed than who own shares in publicly traded companies. So this idea of democracy as a way of life that represents the values, embodies the values of inclusion and participation, deliberation, transparency. These are values that can infuse all aspects of society. So that when we talk about governance, it's, it includes all of us in what we do every day. And yes, it includes elected government and removing the power of private wealth over public decision making because our public decision making has become beholden to invisible often powers of private interest. So it's, it's finding the courage to name that and to remove that, certainly. Um, do you see any irony in the fact that uh, <laughs> the country who is promoting this is a kingdom, you know, that, uh, and, well, and yet this wonderful guy comes and, and meets with us and, and so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about Bhutan and why Bhutan leading the charge in all of this. Well, Certainly, um, it must have its roots in the Buddhist philosophy of really allowing one to go deep and to really ask what makes for human happiness. And if you get serious about that, <laughs> then you realize that people are, who need a sense of agency and problems can best be solved when there is true participation. And so I think um, that I hope that this, this um, decision by the king to basically abdicate his unilateral power. That decision, I would guess, comes out of the deep thinking that is required in Buddhist philosophy where you really look at what is human nature and what makes people happy. And most of us aren't happy if we feel that we are just pawns in somebody else's scheme. And besides that, our problems are so complex now. They, re they have to involve the ingenuity and creativity and the commitment and the buy-in of all of us, of billions of us, or we can't do this. How do we get that buy-in? How do we tap that ingenuity? It's by direct engagement of people, so they feel that they've been heard rather than just are being told, oh, you should do, use a different kind of energy, oh, you should consume locally, whatever. I mean, people don't respond very well to fiat in most instances, and I think that my hunch is, and I have, you know, no more knowledge than any, any of us of how this evolved, but this dramatic decision. I think this may be the first time in human history where power has been so dramatically turned over to what they are evolving here as a democracy. How do you think in the United States, your country, which is, I mean, in a sense, my country too, which is maybe the biggest stumbling block of all to the possible mm -hmm. success of this, at least it has been in, in, in some ways, how do you think the American people will respond to this whole idea of gross national happiness. Do you, do you have any sense of that? Well, I think a lot of my compatriots are near despair, are near, are so trapped in the sense of 
there is no way out. The power of money and interest is so great in our political decision making that it's impossible. So I, what I hope, quite personally, is that by telling the story of Bhutan and all the other stories that, that <laughs> I try to collect and share to show that um, actually we are not trapped. You know, once you understand power in a relational way that, and once you see through an ecological lens, you see that everything we do affects everything around us and our decision not to engage in the U.S. is also shaping the future. But in the U.S., it's, we have to address the, the cynicism that is our greatest threat, the cynicism that money is so taken over our system that there's no way out of it. And I, I just fight that with every breath I have, that uh, what is hardest for us is courage, breaking with the group. We were so social. We are so not atomistic. We are so social. The hardest thing to do is to say, no, I think there's another way. And the pack in the United States, the dominant pack, is either caught up in the, the, this mind trap of these, this two-party fight, um, or they uh, give, have given up. And I think really the challenge is to say, no, there is another way, and to break free from this despair.